Do you struggle to hear the voice of God? Tonight we have best-selling author and prophetic voice Havila Cunnington to talk to us about her brand new book, Created to Hear God, Four Unique and Proven Ways to Confidently Discern His Voice. And she's provided for us, exclusively for our premium members, a link to a personality profile quiz that's going to help you identify where you fall into these four categories. I'm so excited for this. Let's dive into the interview with our dear friend, Havila. Havila, it is so good to have you on Encounter today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I've been going through your material here, and it really is outstanding. I'm excited about discovering what my prophetic personality is. But as a pastor, the number one question I get from parishioners, from people who watch online, is how can I hear the voice of God? If it is God's will to speak to us, why is it so difficult for us to hear him? It is so difficult. And this is somebody who, I mean, I was raised in church. I had a dad who was a prophet. I was around the voice of God for like everything I did in life. You know, I was a, ch a child of the 80s and 90s. You know, we lived in church. And so I, I, I found it difficult. And here I was, I had a front row seat and I wasn't alone. It is so difficult to know if we're hearing God. And I don't think there's anything wrong with anyone who's having that issue. There mm. are some complications that we've created, I think, that are human error uh, that we can uncomplicate. But no, you're not alone. It was hard for me, and it's hard for almost everybody I know. So tell me a little bit about your personal struggle hearing God, because we're going to get into momentarily, there are different ways we hear yeah. God. And you're surrounded in a prophetic community. Did you Did you feel kind of, not ostracized, but kind of just out of the loop because yes. you were different. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, like I said, my dad was very prophetic. My dad was a, it's a funny thing. My dad came from an immigrant family. My grandfather was an Italian immigrant who lived in New York uh, in a one bedroom apartment, became, went through law school, became a Supreme Court justice of New York state for four terms. Um, so he was very, very powerful, very wow. intelligent. Uh, but my dad was sent to Catholic boarding school uh, for his most of his childhood, um, was very turned off by faith and became an atheist uh, mm. for seven years, ended up uh, becoming suicidal, uh, went out one day to a field, took a, a raw pocket knife, like a dull pocket knife, and just cried out, God, Buddha, Krishna, I don't know which one of you is real, but please reveal yourself to me. Uh, and then about a couple months later, he wandered into a little church in Northern California called Timbuktu. Yes, there's a place called Timbuktu. In <laughs> he showed up that night and a man uh, made a call to receive the Lord. And when he invited Jesus to come inside his heart, the beads around his neck began to choke him. And he said, I didn't know what to do because here I am. I've said my very first prayer and I am, I'm being choked. And so he said, I reached up and grabbed the beads and they, I broke the necklace that kind of scattered on this wood floor and everybody wandered around and said, what's going on? And, and he explained uh, what the beads were, which were beads he had been chanting to Krishna. And they had said, well, when Jesus comes in, he delivers you, he takes out all the demons. And so those are demons and you are getting delivered. So fast forward, my dad gets radically saved, begins to hear God's voice and begins to operate like that. So growing up, my dad would walk in the room and say, you know, I was praying and God told me there's a man named Paul. He's sitting on a porch. He's wearing blue. We need to go find him. He had this kind of prophetic evangelism part mm. of his life. So we would get in the car. We'd drive around. I grew up in South Lake Tahoe. We would drive around and we'd see a guy on a porch wearing blue. My dad would get out. This is very common. He would say, is your name Paul? The guy would say yes. And he would say, you know, this is kind of weird. This might seem strange, but I'm a Christian. I believe God speaks to me. And God told me to come find you. Your name is Paul and you need help. And I remember vividly the man breaking down and saying, I'm not a praying man, but this morning I said, if you are real, send someone to me. And wow. I watched my dad do this almost every day. It was a waiter. It was a server. It was, uh, you know, checking into a hotel. It was a flight attendant. He was using the prophetic voice of God, really the hearing God's voice, in everyday life. So here I am, this kid that sit in this front row seat to this experience. And people would say, you must hear God like your dad. You must hear God like your dad. And I wasn't, I wasn't at mm. all hearing God like my dad. In fact, I didn't think I could hear him, which caused so much anxiety in my heart. And then you kind of, you know, to take a side note in third grade, I'm diagnosed with dyslexia, reading and comprehension issues. Later find out I have some ADHD, really great cocktail. 
again, I don't receive those things, but those are things that have been, um, you know, said to me. And I obviously have had to fight those battles. But yeah. for me, I found that, oh, maybe I don't hear God because I have learning issues over here. Maybe in the church, I'm the same way. Maybe I'm just disconnected in both ways. So I always felt like I was an outsider looking in. And it felt like everybody had this unique radio station and I didn't have it. And I, I was kind of humiliated by it. I felt, you know, like Mm. I didn't want anyone to ask me. I hated when people would say, you know, what is God saying? Go, go find out, come back, tell us. I I loathed it because I did not believe I had a direct line to God. I didn't know how to hear his voice. You even talk about being at a camp. I think it may have been YWAM where you were sent out to go do a little devotional and write down what God is saying to you. And it was often empty. Tell us about that. I think a lot of people can relate with that. Yeah, so I was, again, a, a church kid. My parents would send me to different places like YWAM or summer camp. And there was this real classic thing that I think a lot of communities teach, which is go have a quiet time. Go take your Bible, go take your journal, and we'll see you in an hour. And the goal was to teach, obviously, us to go listen for God's voice in the morning, to spend an hour, to pray, to talk to God. And it was torture. I remember Mm -hmm. taking my journals. I didn't spell well. I didn't write well. I didn't read well. So I would spend an hour every morning filled with shame, filled with this like fear that someone was going to find out that I didn't know how to hear God's voice. And I didn't even know it until about two decades later, I'm unpacking a box in my garage. And it was from all, you know, you you find old stuff. And it was journals from my high school years. And I hadn't seen them, like I said, in two decades. I opened it up, and it has the date, and I I know where I am, and it says, God, where are you? I can't hear you. And the next page, I've been listening, you know, God, what are you saying? I really need to, you know, hear your voice. And you see a couple pages and then nothing. And Mm. I had multiple journals like that. That was very real in my life. I did not know how to hear God's voice. Now, I could receive it from someone else, absolutely, But if you put me on my own, I did not know how to hear God's voice. So what was the breakthrough moment for you? When did things shift and transition where you recognized that you could hear the voice of God, possibly were hearing the voice of God and didn't even recognize it? Oh, such a great question. It brings me back to here. I am a 17 year old kid. I am, I'm really battling in school. So I am not winning in school and at Mm -hmm. church, I'm trying to stay under the radar and I am living this kind of dual life. And some guys had picked my sister and I up to go to a party one night after a church service. I mean, that's kind of where we were living. And we're in the backseat of this car. And all of a sudden, this R&B music, 90s R&B music is playing. And I have this clear voice of God, not audible, but this clear knowing. You know, it's it's a clear thought that you are not thinking about. And I hear him say to me, just this clear voice, Havila, what are you doing? You have to get out of here. And I remember at 17, not knowing how to respond. So I told the guys in the front, can you turn the music down? So the guy in the front turns the music down and I am compelled to say something. So I shout out in the darkness, I have a call of God in my life, (laughs) which is very awkward. And as I say it, I begin to cry and I don't know what I'm doing. I wasn't planning on this was my evening, but I had this clear, it's this clear call. And I, I know you know this, but when God invites us in, we have to do, we have to go all in. And so when we live in the middle, we live tortured. And so for me, I was living Mm. in the middle. And I think when we go public, grace comes on us. Like when we actually say I'm all in instead of, you know, assuming. And for me, me going public in my faith with those guys in the car that night, it was like immediate grace, immediate call, an immediate ability to answer the call. And so I remember crying. I looked at my, I have an identical twin sister, Deborah. We're mere twins. So 20% of identical twins are mere twins. I look over at her and I think she's going to kill me because I've just completely ruined the night. And she's crying. And we're both weeping in the back of this car. And then I said to the guys, I'm going to, I'm going to serve God. If you want to do this, you can do this with me, but this is what I'm going to do. And I still laugh because the guy said nothing. It was just pitch black. They've said nothing. It's, it's so awkward. There's no piano player. There's no pastor. <laughs> there's nothing. And uh, I look out the window and I realize that these guys have taken us home without us asking. Like they, they thought we should get these girls home. So we get out of the car. Um, I go into my bedroom. I kneel down by my bed and I say, God, I'm not much. I'm young. I'm 17. I'm a girl. 
and I have no special gifts. In fact, I kind of think I have more liabilities than gifts. Mm. Um, but if you can use me, you're welcome to use me. And I did, you know, at that moment, I thought, oh, I'm going to see an angel, or this is, the, this is the moment where I get to see all the heavenlies. And I saw nothing. In fact, I went to bed that night, and I thought nothing had happened other than me having conviction. But what I learned later was that everything had happened because when you confess with your mouth and you believe yes. in your heart, it's as good as done and heaven begins to have your back in that way. So fast forward, sorry, I kind of went to a, that story because I want you to understand no, that this is about three months later. We hear that God is moving in LA at this church called Harvest Rock. So I have a friend who goes there and her and her husband, and she says, you have to come down and experience what God is doing. I'll fly you and your sister down. So my sister Deborah and I go down to this conference and about the first day, this guy, this teenage guy, approaches my sister. He's our age. And he says, I feel like you have a word for me. I think you're supposed to pray for me. And to be honest, we thought he was hitting on her. I mean, we, just, we genuinely thought, what? we're 17. We're not going to, why would we pray for you? We don't, we're not pastors. We're not part of the prayer ministry team. What are you doing? So we did what every good teenage girl does. We avoided him. And so we avoided him <laughs> for a full seven days. Every time he was there, we would tell each other, warn each other. And then we, if he finally would come to us, we would say, we don't feel led. Because that's what Christians say when we don't want to do it, right? We don't feel right. led. <laughs> and so uh, we would say over and over. And finally, the last night, we're getting up. It's about 1 a.m. We've had prayer. And we get up and the guy taps her on the shoulder. And he says, can you pray for me now? And we are, we're trapped. It's, it's, it's the last night. We know it. We can't get out of it. So we gather around this guy, and I am frustrated. I'm a frustrated 17-year-old girl, my, and my sister is very uh, quiet and reserved, so she's feeling very put on the spot. And so he closes his eyes and puts his hands out like he's going to receive something. I want to punch him in the face, but I, <laughs> I close my eyes. And my friend Stacy, who's on the ministry team, says this, just close your eyes and let's just see what God has. And then she calls me up by name and she says, Havala, you have something for him. And I look at her and her eyes are closed because I would have given her a death stare. Like you are calling me out by name, telling me I have something from God for this guy. And I don't, I don't mm. at all. All I have is frustration. <laughs> if he would like me to, if he'd like to receive frustration, I can give it to him. So he's closing <laughs> his eyes. And then she says something that's so profound. She just says, have only just close your eyes and whatever comes to the surface, just share. So wow. I close my eyes. First thing that comes to the surface is McDonald's fries, which I know is not God. And then all of a sudden the name <laughs> Shadrach kind of rises to the, the name Shadrach. And I'm thinking, I wasn't thinking about Shadrach. Shadrach's not on my you know, favorite name list. So I tell the guy, I said, I don't know why, but I feel like God is saying the name Shadrach. And when I say the name Shadrach, the guy immediately breaks down, shakes, and falls to the ground under the power of God. And I am stunned. I am stunned. I don't know what is going on. I mean, I knew this happens. Of course, I believe in it, but this doesn't happen with me. So fast forward, we share a few words. Then his friends are gathered around. He gets really excited, says, can you pray for my friends? So we pray again. Same thing happens. My friend says, happily, you have something for him. I look at her thinking, I have a twin sister. Call on her. <laughs> she's, she's right here. But I, she says it. I get the name Meshach. And you can imagine three guys later after praying, I get Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and a Daniel. And they all had the same experience. They all would break down and shake or fall to their knees. And they were having this moment. And I'm thinking, do I have the gift of names? Like, what, <laughs> what is happening here? But I knew it was God. After the fourth, th third guy, I'm thinking, this is the Lord. I can see it tangibly. I'm listening for that clear voice. I'm getting that this is God's voice. And then at the end, they all put their arms around each other. Their faces are all kind of puffy. And, you know, they're, they're like a band of brothers. And they say, we're sure you hear this all the time. But a prophet came into our church, and they, they lived in the Midwest. And he called us out separately in a room. And he said, you're a Meshach, you're a Shadrach, you're a Bendigo, and you're wow. a Daniel. And they said, you called exactly each guy by the name that he called us. And I, we would, I wouldn't give it to him. I, we said, absolutely. We hear it all the time. And we, left the, <laughs> <laughs> we left the prayer meeting. And I, it was like my theology and my reality collided that night. Mm. It was as if all the Bible stories I had learned, the, the things I had heard about hearing God's voice, all of that was on a fast motion reel through my heart, through my brain, through my spirit. And I realized, 
oh, wait, I have been hearing his voice all along. I didn't know that was his voice. Wow. I, did, I, I, I didn't know. And so it really gave me permission to know his voice, but also to realize that I was expecting a spiritual experience, and yet it wasn't that spiritual. It was spiritual for them, and it was sacred and spiritual. It just didn't feel it. Feel like so one. you didn't hear an audible voice. You weren't overcome by emotion. You didn't see anything spiritually. There was just a name in your mind, and you yes. said that name. Yes. And I started to do, we actually, my dad got very excited, um, came in the, to the breakfast table one day and said, girls, I have a speaking engagement for you. And we were thinking, because he had heard this story that we had prophesied, and we, we were very, we were like, no, we're not going on the circuit. Like, that's not what we're doing. My sister was going to go to nursing school. I was going to live off my parents. This was the plan, right? <laughs> and uh, so we go to this church in Utah, and we're greeted by the pastor, youth pastor, and he says, hey, we're really excited you girls are going to preach to our youth group. And we heard that you prophesy, and we're so excited that you prophesy. And we are stunned because that we'd only had that one night with that guy. And... So we get in the car and I said, we said to him, well, you know, if God leads, we'll do it. We'll see. And he was a young guy and he said, well, I really hope the Lord leads because everyone's expecting it. <laughs> and so we got out in the car. We weren't even talking to my dad. We were so mad. We weren't even talking to him. My dad's a full Italian, so he can take it. Yeah. And we get out into the host home and my sister and I run to a park and we are crying and we are mad. And we just at that moment said, okay, God, if you did it, then you can do it here tonight. Help us. So we go in that night. They expected 60 kids. They had 160 kids show up. All the adults went with my dad because he was preaching downstairs. So it's my sister and I and all of our age at 160 people. And we began to minister prophetically. And we didn't get home till about 3 a.m. that morning. And we realized it was the power of God. God, the voice was so clear. And yet again, it wasn't an emotional vision trance. It was as clear as day. I had been hearing his voice. And that led me on the journey. So we did that for many, many years, prophesied over, I think the last I counted was about 25,000 people I've given personal words to. And what I have found was when I began to teach people how to hear God's voice, I thought, oh, wow, we, we've got this all wrong. We're teaching people, we're complicating this. And I began to really dive into how do we actually teach people how to hear God's voice, not pray over them, not encourage them, not show them the value, but actually practically show them how to hear God's voice. Well, I think in another session, we can talk a little bit about why you ignored the McDonald's fries <laughs> word. I think maybe that's a do now word for this season. But um, let's talk about these different kinds, because we're talking about how you heard the voice of God, and we'll kind of distill that here in a moment. But there are those who feel, there are those who see, there are those who sense. And let's. so I, I wanted you to walk through for us the four different prophetic personalities and then yeah. we're going to take the quiz with everyone watching right now and you're going to find out which one of those personalities you are but kind of walk through all four of them for us. I love it okay so when I began to teach hearing God's voice I thought how do we do this and I realized as I talked to my dad so da luckily you know I had a little focus group with my my dad and then I live in a very prophetic culture I, I I'm the women's pastor at Bethel Church we have thousands of students from all over the world we teach on the prophetic so I'm around a lot of it, and I began to kind of realize, wait, God really is speaking through four different methods. Now, again, and I want to say this for all of our listeners, because God is sacred. He can speak however he wants to. There's no formula to God. Any formula we create, he breaks. So this is a strategy that is to be helpful, but the main goal of it is to be in relationship with him. It's mm. not a platform ministry. It's not so you can yes. tell your kids what God said. That's awesome. That's a secondary to being in an intimate relationship with him. So that's the goal of this. So what I found was that there were four unique ways. So there are the knowers. The knowers are those that are like a light bulb. They go into an atmosphere. They don't know why, you know, they don't know exactly what God is saying, but God speaks to them through an, a supernatural intuition, wisdom, insight, clarity, and like a prompting. It's like a, like a light bulb. It just comes on. I know I'm supposed to go there. I know I'm supposed to say that. I know I'm supposed to marry them. It's a knowing. They have a lot of wisdom, but they don't have, they wouldn't necessarily believe that it's supernatural or super spiritual, but that's the knower. And the knowers are clear. They know that they know, and that is enough. Then you have your seers, and your seers are those that God speaks to through pictures, imagery. Uh, he really speaks to them through dreams, visions, even daydreams. It's all a visual experience with God. 
And so our seers are those that God can speak to, like I said, in a night dream where God will give them a dream and they steward that and write that down and God speaks to them. My sister's a dreamer. She's an incredible dreamer. Um, And then there are those that God just gives them a vision to build something, build an orphanage, build a ministry, build a business, and they see it. And often it takes them a lifetime to fulfill, but God speaks to them through pictures. Then you have your hearers and hearers are really that classic way that we've been taught to hear God. And this is kind of where we got it wrong. And, you know, we're going to, this is the traditional. Hearers are those that hear God through words, phrases, conversations, narratives, uh, a play-by-play. So God will speak to them in the morning and then they'll get the car and then they'll go to lunch. And God has this kind of play-by-play experience, but it's all through words. It's all through verbiage. It's all through a conversation. And then lastly, you have your feelers. And feelers are those that God encounters through intense emotion or a real physical experience. They get the burden of God. They sit something. They they kind of get a sense of what somebody needs or what where we need to go. And they're the heart in the room. You know, instead of being the, the light bulb or the eyes or the ears, they're the heart. They're the ones that really in experience the emotions of God and are able to bring it forward. They're often even intercessors. They're linked to kind of being intercessors. They're those that carry the heart of God and can bring it forward. So everybody, I believe, has a primary type. It's a way that God interacts with them. But we will all be bilingual and trilingual and quadlingual. We will operate in all of them. But the main goal is like the five love languages. The goal is to find out what yours is so you can encounter God, experience his voice consistently, and know that that's how he encounters you. And I'd be interested to know, those of you watching right now, which one you think you are, which category do you fall into? Write that down in the comments. And we're going to place a link in the description uh, for her book, Created to Hear God, where she goes into explicit detail into all of this. And so let's, how do we identify then this? How do we identify which area we're in? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's start this. So for, you know, for me, I found that I was a knower. So what I found was I had to go back to how do I identify my primary type? So there are two people that have a hard time identifying their primary type. And it's usually those that have been hearing God for a long time and they use all four. And so when you say, what's your primary? Well, I see a little, I hear a little, I know a little. And so it's going back to when was the beginning that you encountered God? What did that, what was that experience? Was it a knowing? Did you see it? Did you see your future? Did you have a vision? Did you have a dream? Did you hear God calling you? Did you have that inner clear voice? Or did you have an emotional experience where you felt like he just was healing you and you had this encounter and you knew, wow, his nearness is here. So I always say, go back to the beginning and figure that out. What was that one moment? And for me in the car was a knowing moment. I didn't Mm. see anything. I didn't experience, I didn't hear an audible voice or even a real clear voice. It was a knowing I've got to get out of here. I've got to call on my life. I need to get out of here. And that was the knowing. And then for the second group of people, it's hard to know, are those that are used to hearing God's voice through other people. So a lot of us, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there, we should have prophetic voices in our lives. We should yes. be asking God what he's speaking through others. So there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes there's this insecurity of, I, 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 I'm not good at this, so I'll get it from somebody else. And what they misunderstand is that secondhand information is not as, strong as firsthand experience. I mean, when you have it yourself, it's like all of a sudden confidence and all that. So how do we discover? I would go back to the beginning and see what God has done. And then I would also ask myself questions even about, uh, so there are in my book, there are, I, the first quarter is about why we need them, how to hear God's voice and how we've gotten it wrong. Because to be honest, we don't hear God because of, there's a few reasons. First, we've overcomplicated God. Yes. We've overcomplicated him. You know, it's the Bible says in John 10, he says, listen, my sheep hear my voice. So it's not, we'll learn to take the class, grow in, get the degree. It's my sheep hear my voice. If you are my sheep and I'm your shepherd, you're hearing my voice. So I want to dispel the idea that we have to learn as much as we have to recognize. Does that make sense? There's a recognizing yes. rather than learning and getting, now, can we grow in it? Yes. Can we give you know, is, what's the difference between a prophetic and a prophet? Very different. We're talking about being prophetic. We're talking about operating and hearing God's voice. So I want to say this, and I should have started with this. The reason I call it prophetic personality is prophetic is simply how God shows up in your world, and personality is how you show up in your world. 
So what I see mm. is that God does both of those. How he shows up in your world, how you show up in your world, that's how we kind of sync up for our prophetic personality. So you go back and you look at that and you see what, what would make sense. So I'm curious, do you have an idea of what you think you might be? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking when you were telling your story, when I went to Bible college, I was an atheist who was radically saved. And I remember everyone in Bible college knew what they were called to do, you know, supposedly. You know, everyone's <laughs> calling each other a prophet or an apostle or or a bishop or a pastor. And I remember going into my dorm room and falling on my knees and saying, God, I don't, I, I have no idea what I'm called to do. And he said to me, fish can't help but swim and birds can't help but fly. Wow. And I knew in that moment that I don't need to know. I will just do. I will instinctively know if that's that's a good way to put it. I'll yep. just be what God's called me to be. And that took all the pressure off. And I think throughout, I've seen all of those things in my life, but I feel like, and I'm interested in those who are watching um, what what your experience has been, but I think I'm a knower. I think that I'm a knower. Yeah. I don't feel, it's funny me being in these prophetic communities. I'll be with friends like uh, Troy Brewer and, and Joseph Z and we'll be in the room and they're like, man, do you feel that, do you feel that <laughs> swirl, that swirl in the room? And I'm just sitting there nodding my head and they're like, look at Alan, <laughs> nothing, nothing. Just no. And I, I. I don't feel it, but I know it. I sense it. I discern it. When I And I'll say things in the pulpit, and I think we need to change how we talk. Your book has helped me with this because I'll say, I feel the anointing mm-hmm. or I feel the presence of God. And I'm, I'm making people think that you have to feel it. And I'm actually, I don't feel it. Yeah. I know that it's there. Does yes, that make sense? Absolutely. And let me say this, because it, I, I, it's actually really important that we use those kind of phrases too. So again, we want to edit, but it's it's unique. So as a, you're definitely a knower, I would say, if that was how you were experiencing him. And knowers, there are strengths and there are weaknesses. So let's mm. go through that for a minute because I think it will help others understand maybe what they are. So for a knower, our weaknesses are often that we that we experience kind of feeling like a heathen in a spiritual experience because we yes. don't have this emotional and tears and we aren't seeing things and we're not thus at the Lord. A lot of knowers feel like they're on the outside looking in and they're not willing to, you know, fake it. They just go, I don't know. I just know. And is that enough? And in a prophetic environment or Pentecost or charismatic, it is one of the hardest things to be as a knower. And, and again, I think each community has their own elevated prophetic personality, which we can talk about. So the yeah. knower, their strengths are that they don't need an emotional or a somewhat spiritual experience to do what they're called to do. They just do it. And that is enough. And over experience and through experience, they know that they know, and that's enough. So for the seer, the seer is one of those that they get the vision, they have this faith for it, but their weakness is that they, they want to change the world, but they have a hard time changing their sheets. Like the day to day is so challenging for a seer. Yes. You know, everyone's like, Hey, what are we going to do? And we're going to build this ministry. We're going to go here. And they're like, but what are we having for dinner? And the, and the seer's like, I have no idea. So the seer's vulnerability is that they can live in the future and not live in the present and wow. actually not have grace to share the vision over and over and over. They get weary because they, they're like, I told you what it looks like. I told you where we're going. And yet it's like, I know we're going to Disneyland, but can you explain why we're stopping in Bakersfield? I need to know what where we're eating. So it's sometimes as a leader or a, in, an employer, that's what happens. And then you have your hearers and your hearers are those that have been elevated very much in the, in the church. And the here, the, the amazing part is that you have a very beautiful conversational, thus saith God kind of experience. So for a hearer to say, God told me, or God says whatever, that's very authentic to them because they're hearing words, they're hearing phrases. It, it makes sense to them. But for the vulnerability of a hearer is that hearers can overwhelm the listener with all the words. So they can go play by play, you know, God, let me tell you what God told me. And then we're in it for an hour. And I went in the here and then God told me this and God told me that. And we want to look at the here and say, we're not your mom. We don't care. <laughs> like, give us the main point. Like we love it, but we don't know. Is that the main point? Wait, is that the main point? And it's, it distracts. We actually miss the word, miss the power of the word with all the words. Yes. And then for the, the feeler, the vulnerability is the strength of a feeler is that they can they experience the heart and the emotions of God. Now I have to be really clear. My dad was a feeler and my husband is a feeler. So mm. I've lived around feelers and it's profound. They'll walk in, like you said, and go, wow, God is, there is something going on. Or they'll even go back to remembering when they were little. And even now they can walk into an environment and know if it's good or bad. They can sense this is, we don't need to do this or we need to go here. They can even pick up on other people's 
uh, experiences and emotions. And one of the things that a vulnerability of a feeler is that they can pick up on things that aren't theirs and own it. So they can walk into a room and maybe there's anxiety in the room and they'll begin to experience anxiety. And if you're not mature in the Lord and knowing that, you know, he can cast down anxiety and that we can cast our cares on him and that this might be a, a, an insight into what's happening in the room and in the atmosphere, they'll take it on themselves and go, I'm anxious. I've got a problem. And so a healthy feeler asks really good questions like, did I walk in with this? Did I walk in with mm. this? And if I didn't, then what is going on? And then secondly, why am I experiencing this and what do I need to do? And those are really important things. And then also uh, an exchange of giving it back to God, the emotion, the experience, praying until there's joy, giving him back what we're experiencing. But an unhealthy feeler can take the room down. They can take the room down. They can take, you know, they're the ones that can almost, you know, think you missed it and God's doing this and their emotions can be distracting. But I, I'm with you. The way I knew I was a, a knower and you'll laugh, I was given a trip to Israel when I was 21 and we went to Israel, my sister and I, with this family, and I didn't know I was on a trip with two feelers. So everywhere we would go, they would say, oh, can you feel it? God is moving. Oh, look, at there's Jesus walked here. And they would weep. I mean, this wasn't like a super, they weren't hyping it up. They were having a profound encounter, profound, mm -hmm. weeping and all that. And I, for the first week as 21 year old, I just lied because I didn't know how to interact with a feeler. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, I can feel it. Abs wow, it's so intense. Let's keep going, you know? And so I would have this, <laughs> and finally Next. a week into it, I finally, they said, can you feel what God is doing? And I said to them, you guys, I'm sorry. I've been lying for a week. <laughs> I have felt nothing. All I feel is that I want a falafel. Like that's literally the only <laughs> feeling that I have. And they, they were so kind. They laughed and they said, you know, we're so sorry. No, we don't, ex we don't expect you to experience any of this. We're intercessors. That's how God speaks to us. But I, that was my moment of realizing, oh, it's okay to not do what everyone else is doing and be different. And I'm still having a profound experience outside of it. So really knowing your weaknesses and your strengths are, are the, in the book, I go through a tremendous amount of things around this. I hope everybody can hear the depth of the revelation here and how you need to get the book. Again, the link is in the description. I see this all the time with married couples, especially <laughs> as they begin their spiritual journey together. One is a feeler and one is a knower. And often the knower feels like they're being left behind or that they're not as spiritual. And that is not the case. They are needed and necessary yes. and just as important. So I want to talk to you a little bit about nurturing this over on Encounter Today on the premium side of things. But before we go, I want you to pray for us. But before you pray for us, who is this book for? Who should click on that link in the description of this video and get this book right now? That's a great question. Well, this book is for those that want to grow in hearing God's voice. I mean, this is the book that will teach you how to pinpoint when God has spoken to you and take you down the path and how to grow. Because a lot of times we can say, oh, I'm a feeler. I know I'm a feeler. But do you know your weaknesses? Do you know your strengths? Do you know how to grow and develop that? There's actually a stewardship in that. It's not just, I'm just a feeler, but you know, again, it's a strength and a weakness. So we have to be really clear. And then I would say, um, the book is for those that want to teach a prophetic culture. So if you're a pastor wow. or a leader, or you're a parent that says, I want to teach my family how to hear God's voice. I want to teach my leaders. I, there's many people, there's a couple churches specifically that I know that take their church through membership and a prophetic personality course because they want to teach them how to hear God's voice. So when they are praying for people at the altar or they're in counseling or they're teaching kids, they are having a, the language. They're knowing how to communicate this. And I want to say this, I know, and I want to pray too, but you mentioned something I want to make sure I catch, which you said, I'm on, you know, when I'm preaching, I might say, I feel this or I see this. And I was the same way. Mm. I thought, uh oh, am I giving people a false sense of what I'm experiencing? But no, in fact, Paul said that he, he wants to he wants to reach all people. He changed his mm. his verbiage to help people. So when I preach now, I will intentionally use I see, feel, hear, and know. Wow! So I can grab the hearts of those in the room because if everything is I know, my feelers go. Well, I don't know. If everything is I see, my hearers go. I don't hear. And so you want to actually bring them in with the verbiage and let them know. How many of you just know that you know? How many of you see this? How many of you you know? And then really giving that kind of dual part. And then I do want to say we, we gave a test, and there's a prophetic personality test that we have, and we gave it to 150,000 people. And it was just on, online. It was on a Facebook test. It wasn't, you know, centered around in any 
faith or any group of people, just anybody who wanted to take a prophetic personality test. And out of 150,000, the number one prophetic personality was, I, I, actually, I'll ask you, what do you think the number one one was? Feeler. Yes. You're was exactly it really? right. Yes. And it was shocking. It was well over 60% were feelers. And so, again, that's awesome if you're in a charismatic Pentecostal movement. It's mm -hmm. really tough if you're more in a conservative that's true. environment. And so we have to understand that maybe we're feeling left out of our environments because, you know, the, uh, the, the faith, the, the charismatic love feelers, we love seers, we love hearers, the knowers feel left out. The conservatives often love the knowers and they love the hearers, but the feelers get completely left out. And, you know, <laughs> so it's really knowing where we land in that and finding that to be true. And the least amount in the, in the test was, I guess I'll let you guess that as well. The Knowers. least amount. No, amazingly, no. It was actually it the Sears. So oh, Sears are very sense. unique. And Sears, yes. they're very, I mean, it's really almost down to like less than 20% are Sears. So the idea that our viewers might be saying, I need the dreams and the visions and I need, and I just want you to know, that's not a very common experience. Wow. So it's okay if you don't have that. Uh, it's it's least likely, and I think we have a community of feelers that also need to be nurtured. Um, and I think there's even some, I remember teaching on feelers and a man running up from the back, and he said, I have been in, I've been going to a counselor and trying to figure out what's going on, and I think you solved it. So mm. I think, you know, again, I don't want anyone to hijack their mental health, and I want you to take what you need and, and figure that out. But I think for some feelers, they just feel like something's wrong, and yet God wants to actually use that in a, in a divine, like sacred way uh, that maybe you're trying to get rid of something that he actually has given you. And so helping them as well. Well, Helen Keller, when she was asked, what is the greater affliction? She said, deafness by far is the greater affliction. And it's interesting how much the inability to hear can impact your life. It can dramatically, dramatically impact your life. Even those with severe hearing impediments also have speech impediments. Wow. So your ability to speak is hindered by your inability to hear. And so we all want to speak the word of God. We want to prophesy. We want to pray. But we got to learn to hear first. Would you pray for us that our ears that. would be open to all of these categories? Yes. Lord, I thank you for every viewer, everyone who's watching this, whether in real time or a replay. And Lord, we just, I thank you that they are yours and that you created them to hear your voice, that you are always speaking and they are created to hear your voice and they are missing nothing that you are right there with them, that they have access to a God that is ever present. And so I ask right now, first of all, we just, we just expose the lie that says that they don't get to sit at the table, that they don't get to be included, that they somehow are missing something or they're not spiritual enough or they don't have, they're not profound enough or they're, they're too emotional or whatever it is. We just say, we break that lie and we say, no, you have a seat at the table and I ask God that you would go in and begin to confirm and remind them that you have been speaking to them their whole lives. Lord, I pray for every leader that's watching this, every parent that's watching this, every employer that's watching this. I pray that you would help us to create a prophetic culture where people can interact with you because you are the source of all good things. You're the source of wisdom, intelligence, income. You are the source of all. And so, Lord, we ask that those connect our connections with you would grow and we would teach others to connect with you in a profound way. We thank you that you are the shepherd and we are the sheep and you are a good shepherd in Jesus name. In Jesus name. If you receive that, say amen. And let me know in the comments too, all of you watching, what did you get from this? Well, I, there's a lot that you got from it, but let's have a conversation in the comments. I'm going to be looking at all of the comments. Let's talk a little bit about how we're growing in our ability to hear. And we're going to head over to EncounterToday.com to have an uncensored interview to continue this conversation to see how we can nurture this ability to hear. I can't thank you enough for being with us on Encounter today. Thank you for having me. And I'm so excited. Like you said, throw it in the chat. If you're a knower, seer, feeler here, uh, you'll be amazed at those that are watching. I mean, you will love it to see that. And like you said, even in your marriage or your kids, you know, find out. It's a really fun way to interact. It's been an honor to be here. I love it. And you can get created to hear God anywhere books are sold. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it's everywhere. It's also on Audible for all of my, those that like to listen to books. Did you read I, it? I read, this is the first book I've, I've written 12 wow. books, but this is the first book I've ever read out loud. And so I'm really excited about it. I'm very proud of it. That's You'll hard to it. do, by the way. Did you? Very. 
Well, I'm dyslexic too, so reading is not. It's a fun excruciating. Thing. Yeah, so I was very anxious about it. I told the the producer, I said, I don't read out loud. It's something I don't like doing. So mm-hmm. to read a whole book feels very, you know, I could be humiliated. But there was grace, and she was wonderful, and I'm really proud of it. Well, the link is in the description. I'm going to be getting copies for me and my team and for our culture. I suggest all of you do the same. The link is in the description. Thank you for joining us. Let's head over to EncounterToday.com. Become a premium member and you get access to this uncensored conversation as well as with all of our other guests on Encounter Today. We'll see you there. God bless. If you believe we have crashed craft, as uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non human biologics? He asked me point blank, Have you read your Bible lately? And I said, Well, sir, I think I know what it says. And he said, Well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic. It turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed, and the U.S. government has the wreckage. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning a demon. 